All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Catalyst webinar series. The Catalyst webinar series is a bi-weekly educational platform for creating success and change in your club and career. We're very excited to have SCPGA past president and Hacienda Golf Club Pro Emeritus presenting on the history of the game. Andy's knowledge, those of you that know Andy, Andy was also the host of the uh, Mercedes Championship on Fox Sports West for many years, which was a, a, a pro-am event that Mercedes sponsored where club pros and their club champions would play in a, in a match play event to qualify uh, to go to Hawaii. And it was actually televised on Fox Sports West and Andy, along with Jim Kelly, were the host of that, uh, of that broadcast. And Andy was phenomenal. As I mentioned, he's a past president of the SCPGA and uh, also the Pro Emeritus, longtime golf professional at Hacienda Golf Club in La Havre Heights. And Andy's depth of knowledge on the history of the game is really unrivaled by any other member in the Southern California section, so much so that we could do a really like a five and six part uh, history of the game um, by decade with his wealth of knowledge. And, and we've talked about doing that um, and over the last five years or so, Andy's presented on the history of the game, I think three times. So here he goes again, um, needing no introduction, Andy Tooney, take it away. Thanks, John. Well, uh, um, coming to you live from the Marriott Shadow Ridge down here, beautiful Palm Desert, which is right up the street from where you used to work in Monterey Country Club for years. Uh, by the way, it wasn't Mercedes, although it was Mercedes in Northern California. It was Subaru and Lexus in Southern California, but no big deal. Just Lexus. Uh, <laughs> so, right. so here we go. Um, I'm going to kind of scan through these things. Um, the first part of this, um, but there's kind of six things I think all fellow PGA members and associates ought to know. Um, basically, the origins of the game. Uh, what were the old balls and clubs like and how did they change over the years? Where did the rules come from and how, how did they differ from what we have for rules today? Uh, the four major championships and the four major uh, international matches, if you will. And then the final thing is going to be, you should know something about the history of your own golf club. If you don't, maybe that's something you ought to work on. So there's a picture. This is, I think, is from 1340 on, from Gloucester Cathedral. Uh, so it looks like some young lad playing a ball and stick game. And that's basically what golf is for all of us. There were many forms of this game. Uh, here's one called uh, Jeu de Mail. It was played literally around town in, in France. Okay. This is a game called Colvin here, which is actually uh, the verb to culb the ball. K-O-L-B was their verb to strike the ball. This is Dutch uh, in Holland. Uh, and that's where the word golf actually comes from. The culb or the to culb the ball was the club that you hit the ball with, or the, or it was if it was on ice. It may or may not have been a ball. It was probably more like ice hockey than it was, was golf. Here's a couple of young lads that uh, are really dressed up for the game and almost look like some of the people back in the 70s. Uh, here, here's a, a picture of Mary Queen of Scots. Now, uh, it, there's a story goes. Uh, she is where we got the term caddy from. She used to employ a couple of military cadets to carry her golf clubs. Because back in those days, there was no limit to the number of golf clubs you could carry. So there might be two or three caddies carrying a couple of different bags of golf clubs just around so she could play the game. Uh, here's one of the first captains of the Honorable Company of Edinburgh Golfers. That's what H-C-E-G stands for. His name is William Inglis. Uh, very close to the word English. Uh, and we're going to talk about the Honorable Company of Edinburgh Golfers here in just a second, because that's where the rules come from. And this is, an old, this is a funny photograph, or I should, should say a painting of being in the gorse. I wonder how many of you out there have actually played in Scotland and Ireland or even England where you hit it into the gorse. You really don't want to go in there, trust me. All right, so this was an international match, 1682, between the Scots and the English. And for the longest time, the Scots would win these things. But that's what a bunker used to look like. And they were literally, literally hollows in the ground that sheep used to dig up to protect themselves from the wind. And so finally, that because it was, links were built on sandy soil, that became bare sandy soil. 
And so that's what a bunker looked like way back in those days. And if you play uh, courses like Prestwick, uh, some of the bunkers still look like that. <laughs> All right, what do we got to come? To? All right, so here we go with the clubs and, and balls of the game. So on the far left is the feathery. So that was the first golf ball that was played way back in the 1800s and maybe a little bit before that. It literally took a guy like old Tom Morris or young Tom Morris to, uh, uh, you know, you can make about five of these in a day. So they were extremely expensive, almost as expensive or sometimes more expensive than building a hickory shafted golf club. And then the gutta percher ball came out in, uh, in 1848 and it literally split up two ball makers and fellow uh, greens keepers and professionals of the game. That being old Tom Morris and John Patterson. So Patterson was the first golf professional. He started playing the gutta percher ball and old Tom did not like that. So he, for all intents and purposes, fired him. Uh, and they kind of separated, went their separate ways. But as you know, old Tom and young Tom Morris won the Open Championship, which was first played in 1860. The first winner was actually Willie Park. That wasn't old Tom or young Tom. Uh, but they kind of split ways because the gutta percha ball became an easier ball to make, much less expensive. And that's how old Tom was making his money. And, you know, old Tom was utterly the keep, literally keeper of the greens. He was like a, our modern green keeper. He wasn't really a golf professional. So he was a golf ball club maker and the keeper of the green back in his days. So there you have a look at the early golf balls that went so through. So Andy, yeah. I have a, a, a question. Yeah. Now, is there any connection between the expensive uh, artist process of making the feathery ball and the format of scotch being alternate shot where a lot of players couldn't afford a ball and so that's why they would play alternate shot because there was only one ball between two people uh i don't think so because back in those days the game was mainly played by royalty or people that uh, worked at golf courses you know the average uh, uh person really couldn't even afford golf balls and clubs. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the wealthy, they could afford several feathery golf balls. I don't think that was an issue per se. When the gutta percha ball came out, uh, then a lot of people could, could afford to play the game because you knock it off in the gorse and you can't find it. So you're kind of done. But, but the play of the game was all match play because that's the only way they really thought about playing the game back in those days, okay? And you, when we get to the rules, you're going to see that all the rules were basically made for just one-on-one -on -one match play. They didn't even think about playing stroke play and actually keeping a score. It was just how many up or how many down you were uh, versus your opponent. Uh, good question, though. Good question. All right. So I think next we're going to see some golf clubs. So you see those very wide-headed golf clubs. They're called long noses. And from the left to the right, you'll see the evolution of the original play club, which was the driver, up to the modern persimmon club, which, of course, we call a driver. And then over the right-hand side, you see a variety of different kinds of iron clubs. Back in those days, they were all hickory shafted. In fact, the steel shaft really didn't come out until 1925 in that era. And this is a good number for people to know. Um, John, you would have been around when this came out. A lot of our younger professionals only have ever seen Metalwoods. They really didn't come into the game until 1979. So, I mean, it's amazing how the club has changed and oh, how that has changed how far we can hit a golf ball. When you consider if you took an old long nose play club like that one on the far left and hit a feathery golf ball, uh, let's see, the first open championship was played in 1860 at Prestwick. And it was uh, three rounds of 12 holes in one day, 36 holes, but the golf course is only 12 holes. And young Tom Morris, uh, the first hole was a par six. Young Tom Morris with a club looking like that long nose on the left and the feathery golf ball made a double eagle, which would be a three on the par six. 
Uh, I think it was the second time he played in the Open Championship. He won it four times, as did his father win it four times. So it just gives you an idea of what golf clubs used to look like back in those days. So Andy, uh, Andy, when they won it in 1860, any idea how big the field was in those events? Oh, not more than a dozen guys. Not more than a dozen guys in Old Tong. It, uh, well, there was there was the the Park brothers. Billy was one of them. Mungo was one of them. Uh, the Morrises and maybe another handful of players that figured they had a chance. So, yeah, it wasn't a highly competitive field, and they were shooting high seventies, low eighties. Uh, if you were, if they would have played eighteen holes with the which pretty good when you're considering the the equipment that they had back in those days. Yeah. And speaking uh, of the equipment. Why hickory versus any other kind of wood? Uh, it's more durable, uh, e easier to find, but much more durable than anything else. Uh, it would bend, by the way, if you got mad and hit it on the ground, it would bend like a steel shaft would nowadays. But it was, it was more pliable, more durable. That was the reason why. And it had quite a bit of flex patterns in, in it as well. Yeah. All right, so there's uh, there's the first president of the Honorable Company of Edinburgh Golfers again. And now there's the, the Silver Club Trophy, which was the very first club trophy for their championship in 1744 and is played on the Leaf Links. Now understand in those days, most golf courses had a variety of number of holes. I referred to Presswick having 12 holes. Uh, I think Musselboro had 14. Oh, St. Andrews back in those days had 22 holes, by the way. And then it got cut down to 18 later on because uh, it's really a city park. And so they took part of the land back for the park itself. All right, so here we go. Now, this I'm going to delve into this and hopefully I won't go too, too far down a rabbit hole. Sorry, this isn't bigger, but these are the original 13 rules of golf. And I'm going to tell you a couple of these and how they relate to our rules today. This, this would be a lot of fun. So rule number one was you must tee the ball within one club length of the hole. Think about that, John. Think about it. <laughs> All right. So you, you're, you're scooping dirt out of the previous hole, making a mound of dirt upon which you stick the ball and hit it from that mound of dirt. Okay, now you can imagine what the hole ended up looking like after about four or five matches that morning. So if there wasn't any hole liner back in those days. Uh, an old friend of mine, Dr. Archie Baird, who's gone to the big golf courses up in the sky, told me once he thinks that the hole liner came from somebody finally saying, oh my gosh, you know, the holes, this is a mess. Cut off a piece of uh, a downspout from the, a gutter, which is basically a round downspout, and it's about four and a quarter inches in diameter, which is what the golf hole is today. So we think that's where the whole liner came from. But think about that. So you're piling up dirt upon which you strike the golf ball. So rule two was tee, you must tee the ball on, on the ground. Okay. So again, that was a mound of sand. So that's rule one and two. You got to tee it off within a club length of the hole. So you're literally teeing it off from the previous putting surface, which you know obviously wasn't a beautiful green. It was probably dirt itself. The tee, the wooden tee, as we know it today, wasn't even invented until 1899. An African-American dentist by the name of George Grant invented it because I guess he used to go out and play golf early in the morning and then work on his patient's teeth and he still had some dirt in his hands from making a pound of dirt to tee off from. And he thought, I got to do something about this. So George Grant, Dr. George Grant, the dentist, invented the modern wooden tee. So that's um, a whole, I mean, rules one and two, which is now, of course, uh, our teeing ground holes, which is rule number six. So number rule five, this is kind of interesting. Hope I read this right. If your ball comes among a watery uh, uh, way or watery filth, take it out, tee it, play it with any club, and allow your adversary one stroke. Okay, so you're playing stroke play, obviously. Okay, you're not playing, I mean, excuse me, you're playing match play. You're not playing stroke play. So you give one stroke to your adversary. In other words, you add a stroke to your score. So what rule is that now for us, of course, of course, that's all of our penalty area rules, which is rule number 16 uh, today. So very similar uh, to what we do today, just the verbiage is a little bit different, obviously. 
Uh, now, rule 10, which is an interesting one too. If a ball be stopped by any person, horse, dog, or anything else, it must be played as it lies. Okay, and that's like rubber the green, right? All right, so rubber, rubber, the, rubber the green nowadays is rule 11.1, .1, outside influence, okay? So, so the same kinds of rules, just worded a little bit differently. Uh, number 12 on the original rules was, let's see, uh, he whose ball lies furthest from the hole is obliged to play first, obliged to play first, okay? So that's our rule of honor or who's away or order of play, which is now 6.4a. So still the same kind of rule. And again, thinking it's only match play. So we still use that kind of order of play and stroke play, but in match play, because that's all they did back in those days, uh, even if it was one-on-one -on -one match play or four-ball match play, they played a lot of four-ball matches, which you saw that one picture of the international match. And there was a lot of money on the line when the Parks would play the Morrises. They might play for 20 pounds. Now, in the 1860s and 70s, 20 pounds was a lot of money. We're talking about maybe 100 bucks. Uh, but some of them, the lords and ladies might put up the money for these guys to play against each other because, you know, old Tom Morris, he didn't have a lot of money making those feathery golf balls. And then the final one here is, is an interesting one, too. Neither trench, ditch, or dike may, uh, may, uh, made for preservation of the links nor scholars' holes, I still don't know what those are, or soldiers' lines shall be accounted as a hazard. The ball is to be taken out, teed, and played with any iron club. Now, interesting that they say played with any iron club. I don't know why you couldn't, if you're teeing it, why you couldn't play one of those long nose drivers or fairway woods. But obviously, that's, uh, that's our rule number 16, which is abnormal ground conditions. And so the similarity of the rules was quite something, but back in those days, they had 13. In fact, it wasn't until 1897 that uh, the Royal and Ancient came up with the more extensive rules, which were really just a, you know, a combination of what we had way back in the 1744s. Uh, and now, of course, we've got him back to 24 rules. You know, we kind of condensed it back down so it's almost the way it was originally. So it's kind of fun to, to look at those rules and compare them to what we have today. Any questions on that, John? Especially the teeing the ball within one club length of the previous hole. Yeah. I don't think that would render on any of our case of play issues. <laughs> yeah the, well you got to get out of the way in a hurry if somebody's coming up from behind you that's for sure <laughs> all right so there is press week, and that's a look at the modern press week and i mentioned that the original uh open championship was held there for for 70 um, excuse me for several years in the 1860s and willie park won the very first one and uh dr archie baird my old friend um uh, he had a pro shot next to the uh uh, the uh, actually, excuse me, a museum next to the pro shop in Gullen, and he was married to Willie Park's granddaughter. So that's how he accumulated all this great memorabilia. He actually had the the watch and chain, the watch watch fob that Willie Park was given because he had won the championship, because that was before they actually had what we're going to see. I think next, yeah, there you go. On the left is the Clara jug. On the right is the belt that was the prize that was given to the Open champion for many, many years until young Tom Morris won it three years in a row. So once he won it three years in a row, they retired the belt. He won it in 1868, 69, and 70. They retired the belt. He got to keep the belt. That's still on a display in the Royal and Ancient uh, uh, front room there, their museum room, where they have the Claret Jug as well. In fact, I happened to play the old course years ago, and uh, we were having a visitation to the RNA. We got into the RNA, and the guy who was the curator of all the trophies there had the Claret Jug out on a table. He was polishing it, and I stopped, and I think I held the group back. We had about, we had about 20 people. 
And they said, uh, sir, you might want to put that away before we walk into the room. And you go, oh my goodness, you know, he didn't realize that the Claire Jug was still sitting out there and he was working on it a little bit. Claire Jug's not that big. I'm sure you've all seen it on TV. The belt is much bigger. And actually, I think the belt's worth a lot more because that's pure silver, that little carving that's on the, the, the belt buckle there. So that was uh, that was the first trophy for a number of years until young Tom won it three times. Young Tom and old Tom won it four times a piece. So they were pretty prolific golfers. And there they are, young, young Tom on the right, and old Tom on the left. And I'm sure you've heard the stories about young Tom literally dying on, on Christmas Day, I think, after his wife died in childbirth birth while he was away playing in a golf tournament. So there's a lot of stories about them. And if you haven't seen the movie about young Tom, you really should uh, watch it someday. Okay, now there is a group of golfers. Um, the guy with the really thick beard in the middle there, that's old Tom. John Patterson is one of those guys. I never did find out which one of those is John Patterson, the gentleman who kind of broke away from the old Tom because he was playing the gutta percha balls. And I don't think that's John on the right that's actually getting ready to hit the ball there. But you can see the galleries were very close, <laughs> but the galleries were only about 20 or 30 people, even if they were playing for, you know, 20 or 50 pounds. Hey, All right. Any, yes, any sir. About, uh, can you go back to that previous slide? Yep. So a quick question about the, the uh, dissonance between Robertson and old Tom Morris. And it was about the the gutta percha ball. Was it a fine? It was more of a financial thing, not so much that the gutta percha ball was a much better performing ball. Absolutely, it was really absolutely. Taking money out of Tom's pocket. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, exactly right. Patterson was taking a, a livelihood away from old Tom Morris because he wasn't paid much for being the keeper of the green uh, and, and and or course designers. He designed several golf courses back in those days. Um, so he really ob objected to the fact that Patterson started playing the gutta percha ball, which only costed pennies to, to build. And like I said, I think I referred to the fact that old Tom could only make about five featheries in a day. And so featheries probably cost several pounds uh, when he sold them. Uh, and they were, it was a very painstaking process and literally, it was literally looked like uh, two oval pieces put together, almost like the modern baseball. Almost it's shaped the same way as a baseball, and it had to stuff these wet feathers in this little pinhole, and then put it in a in a form and keep it to, from expanding too much. So yeah, that's why they broke apart basically, not because they had uh, differences in teaching or playing the game or anything like that, just the ball that they were playing. Yeah. So there's the first triumvirate: Barden, Braid, and Taylor. Uh, between them, let's see how many British, I think they won 16 British Opens between them. Yeah, 16 British Opens between 1894 and 1914. Um, Harry Varden, the guy that's hitting the ball there, uh, was called the stylist. And you'll probably remember, well, we'll get to that in a minute, the story about him playing against uh, uh, Francis we met in 1913. Uh, but those guys, they dominated the game in the early, uh, the late 1800s and the early 1900s. Uh, and where did we get the Varden overlap grip? That's from Harry Varden. That's the way he gripped the golf club. A lot of them just used the baseball grip back in those days because they really didn't know any other way to hold the club. Uh, and there's that uh, Walter Hagen was the first American born golfer to win the Open Championship the British Open Championship in 1922. So that's how long it took with 62 years before an American born professional or amateur won an Open Championship. So that's how much of the Scots dominated the game. Andy, you're saying American born, you said it twice there. Does that mean that there were British born Americans that had won it prior to that? British born Americans, uh, yes, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. But he was the first one born in the U.S. of A. that won the Open Championship. Yeah. Okay. Now here's where golf kind of started in the U.S. of A. Uh, the Apple Tree Gang in Yonkers, New York. And this is what a golf course looked like back in those days. Okay. I mean, it just somebody said, "Oh, like, let's cut out three holes, and, and just uh, cut, you know, cut some grass a little bit shorter, and just, you know, putter around and have fun in our backyard." I mean, uh, th th that's what. That's what golf was all about. It was nothing like we know it today. Completely different game. 
much more casual and, uh, and the equipment wasn't very well suited to the game anyway. All right, so and there, there's the Reed and Lockhart, which are two of the uh, more famous golf club makers in the USA uh, back in those days. And, and they're actually kind of fiddling around underneath the shade of a tree there as they're getting ready to play that three or four holes that were literally in one of their backyards in, the, in Yonkers. All right, so the first US Open Championship. So we talked about the Open Championship, which was pretty much dominated by the Scots and the British uh, back in the 1860s and perhaps the turn of the century. The first US Open was in 1895. And I, I feel that all fellow PGA members and associates, not only should we know the name of our PGA Championship trophy, which we'll get to in a minute, but we should know the name of the US Open trophy which is called the Havermeyer trophy because Mr. Havermeyer was the first president of the USA and he was the founder of Newport uh, Country Club and uh, because he's the president that's why the, the trophy is named after him and the two gentlemen you see there C.B. McDonald and Horace Rollins Horace Rollins on the right was the professional to win the first U.S. Open C.B. McDonald was a golf course designer. He won the first amateur in 1895. So those are two names that we ought to know if we want to know anything about the history of the game. And now this next one, I think, uh, oh, I'm going to come back to this one, by the way, at the end of all of this. That's George Von Elm. I'll tell you about him later. So there's the Theodore Havermeyer, okay? So he's the one that was the first president of the USJ, the founder of Newport uh country club and that's where the, who the trophy is named after now we should know these three, three people big guy on the right ted ray kid in the middle francis we met shorter guy on the left that's harry bard uh we've all seen the movie of the greatest game ever played when uh, francis we met beat, beat these two guys in a playoff at brookline country club okay or the golf club at Brookline. And Francis, of course, lived right across the street from the golf course um, in 1913, that was. So those were two of the most prominent players of the game, the two guys that he's kind of shaking hands with. And he beat them in the playoff the next day. I think he was the only one that was under par to win that. Uh, but he was the first, uh, again, American born to, to win the, the U.S. Open because C.B. McDonald and Horace Rollins weren't, weren't American born. That's, that's the most unusual thing that people probably don't understand. But there's what they actually look like. The characters that played them in the movie, I thought they did a heck of a job. They all, they all look just a, a lot like these guys. I mean, big old Ted Ray was a pipe smoking guy and Harry Varden was a very, actually a very shy, bashful man as they uh, predict errors, put him in the movie, and he had some demons that he had to deal with. Um, and he was an unusual fellow, but a hell of a player, obviously. Okay, PG of America, 1916. Whoops, I just lost my mouse. He fell on the floor. Um, if you don't know about the origins of the PG of America, goodness gracious, you ought to research it a little bit. Gentleman on the right there, Rodman Wanamaker. He literally let our founders of the game borrow a room in his department store, a, a, an upstairs room that I've visited. Uh, uh, Tony Latendry and I did it in the 100th anniversary. We were back there in New York. And uh, it's just a tiny little meeting room. And uh, there's a plaque on the wall outside the door to the meeting room that indicates that that's where the PGA of America was born. And Mr. Wanamaker, uh, that's why his uh, name is on the trophy, and uh, he, he donated the trophy. By the way, trophies were extremely expensive back in those days. You're talking about a big hunk of silver. So that thing's probably worth several thousand dollars now, and it's probably worth a couple of hundred dollars back there when he had it fashioned at the local trophy maker. Um, and here, I think the next one is our first president. Yeah, Robert White was our first president. He's a Scottish-born. Uh, American professional that moved, moved to the States and was our very first prez in 1916. And then here's the gentleman who won our first PGA championship. Okay. That whoops. I 
jump back and forth there. That's right. That's Jim Barnes, gentleman Jim Barnes. And there's the picture of the trophy right there. Pretty big trophy. If you've never seen it in person, I mean, it's it's a it's a large trophy. Uh, you got to hoist it with both hands. And when you saw uh, Brooks kept hoist it, hoist it, I should say, for the third time a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he's a big dude, and I think he held it up with both hands too. I don't think you hold that thing with one hand. It's it's a, it's a humongous trophy. But gentleman Jim was a, was a hell of a player, very very long driver of the golf ball back in those days when they actually had a balada golf ball. But it was it didn't go as far as our balladas did back in the fifties and sixties when I started playing the game. So there's a little bit about the beginning of the PGA Championship. Who was our first winner? Who was our first president and how did we get started? You should research that if you're a PGA member, learn a little bit more about our association. On the left, again, Harry Varden. On the right, Glenna Collette Bear. So why are these two names so important? <coughs> Those are the two uh, low scoring trophy names for the lowest score on the PGA Tour and the lowest score on the women's tour each year. Harry Varden, we've talked about the stylist. He won a ton of open championships. Glenna Collette Bear won several uh, women's amateurs. So those are the names on those two trophies. And actually, the, the, the Varden Trophy for long scoring PGA Tour player is actually a, a sculpture of his hands on the grip of a club to show the overlapping grip. It's a very interesting trophy. I've never seen it. You just should, you should look it up. <clears throat> So those are the, the two names that are associated with the low scoring average for the two tours, the LPJ tour and the PJ tour. <coughs> Excuse me, let me have a sip of something here real quick. All right, so the Ryder Cup. Samuel Ryder on the left, George Duncan on the right. Samuel Ryder was a grass seed salesman. Uh, when the U.S. professionals and amateurs started going over to the U.K. to play in the Open Championship, he decided we should get together a bunch of these lads and have them duke it out to see who, who are the better <laughs> teams of players. So the first one was actually in 1929. They had a couple pseudo Ryder Cups in 27 and 28, but the first official one was 1929. That trophy you see there, when you see it in real life, it's amazingly small. It's only 16 inches high. I've actually had pictures taken with it. And that little golf figurine on top of it is a, a teaching professional by the name of Abe Mitchell. He was Sam, Sam Ryder's teaching professional. So there's one of your first well-known or maybe not so well-known golf coaches. And that's a name that I think PGA members should know because uh, if it wasn't for Abe Mitchell, Samuel Ryder wouldn't become, uh, he was a decent playing amateur, but he learned to love the game. And then Mr. Ryder wouldn't put up the money to sponsor the first Ryder Cup officially in 1929. So just some kind of trivia stuff there, if you will. What's the next cup matches between US and UK players? Named after George Herbert. Walker, and yes, he's a he's one of the the bushes from the, you know, the the bushes are descendants of his, I should say. Uh, he was a banker, made quite a bit of money in the banking business, uh, and he was the 1920 uh, USJ president. So the first Walker Cup was named after him in 1922. So that's where the Walker Cup name come from. And it, as you probably well know, the Walker Cup is the U.S. amateurs playing against the U.K. amateurs. We hosted it here just a few years ago, 2017, at Los Angeles Country Club, which is where we're going to be hosting the U.S. Open here in a couple of weeks. So that's where it came after. Okay, the name it came after. And where's the, uh, the Curtis Cup is the name of the cup that's... Uh, uh, for the, the female amateurs from the US playing the female amateurs from the UK. The Curtis sisters won four amateurs between them. So that's why the Curtis Cup is named after them. It was started in 1932. And then the final, oops, bouncing back and forth here, the final cup matches that we know 
were named after Karsten Solheim. The Solheim Cup started in 1990. And his first job, he was an engineer for General Electric. Uh, and, and most of you probably know how he got started building those putters in his garage. And when I saw those, I'm sure John would think this too. When you first saw that putter that went ding, when you hit the ball, you thought, these are not going to sell. This is not going to happen. And I'll never forget my first ping sales rep, uh, <laughs> Elbert Reed, came to me one day and he says, uh, bro, these are going to be great. And I said, how much are they, Bert? And they just, I mean, that made that horrible sound and they looked like just a piece of rectangle metal on the <laughs> bottom of the shaft. I said, well, they're $16. They said, Bert, hey, Bert, a dozen balls is $14. A, a bullseye putter by a cushion that is twelve dollars you're going to sell these for sixteen dollars you'll never make a living well he retired a long before i did make a lot more, made a lot more money than i did too so he knows something that i didn't know and obviously ping putters have been a fantastic innovation in the game as as ping clubs which are maybe the precursor to the cavity back uh, clubs that we all play today or most of us play today so the solheim cup started in 1990 and of course that's the matches between the u.s professional ladies tour and the uk professional ladies tour or not necessarily uk they could be all all throughout europe so those are your four cup matches the Ryder cup the walker cup the curtis cup and the solheim cup uh fellow pg members associates you should know something a little bit about each one of those because they're a big part of our game these days okay all right so uh other tournaments we talked about the Open Championship, which started in 1860. The US Open, which started in 1895. The PGA, which started in 1960, or 16, excuse me. Uh, the Masters didn't start until 1934, when those two guys on the right got together, Bobby Jones and Clifford Roberts. Uh, I don't know who the guy on the left is. John, who's that guy on the left? Uh, I think that's Arnold Palmer. Yeah, yeah, you bet. The king, the king. Uh, he was my idol, obviously, because he had a kind of a quirky golf swing, as do I, but boy, did he make it work. So that was started in 1934. Here's a great master trivia question for you. Who won the master? What two players, what two professionals won the masters the first time they played in it? Well, Fellow PGA members ought to know the very first one. Who won it in 1934? Because we used to have one of our awards named after him. Oh, that's Horton. That's got to be Horton Smith. Uh, Horton Smith. Horton Smith. Very good. And I think if I go to the next frame, it might show Horton Smith. I got, nope, I got the, the, the triumvirate. Uh, there's Horton Smith. Okay. Uh, and it was originally called the Augusta Invitational, by the way. It wasn't even called the Masters. The other guy who won it the first time he played in it was Fuzzy Zeller. <laughs> which is a, that's a great trivia question all right so yeah it was called the augusta invitational in 1934 <clears throat> and of course um it, uh, bobby jones who uh, built the golf course uh, with uh, uh, dr alistair mckenzie uh, in 1932 decided to have this tournament along with clifford roberts uh, bobby jones had won 13 majors as an amateur and if you don't know a little bit about Bobby Jones, you should. You should know a lot about Bobby Jones, actually. In 1930, he won all four what they considered to be the major championships back in those days. And that would be the U.S. Open, the British Open, the U.S. Amateur, and the British Amateur. Won all four of them. And I uh, can't remember the sports writer off the top of my head who called them the impregnable quadrilateral. To win all four of those majors in one year was quite a feat. And after that, Jones pretty much decided, okay, I'm going to stop playing in competitions and just enjoy playing the golf uh, as, as an individual golfer, just playing the game for fun. Um, I'm going to tell you a cute story. I go to the Masters just about every year. I think I've been six or seven times now. There's a young lady. Her name is Catherine Lucky. She's married now, and I can't remember Ms. Lucky's uh, new last name. I made to a gentleman by the name of Toby. I call her young lady because she's younger than me, John. So the first time I met her, I said, how many times have you been here? 
this year when I bumped into her again, because she sits right behind the green on number nine, right at the corner of the ropes where the players walk off the ninth green. I asked her, so how many years now, Ms. Lucky? 55 years she's been to the Masters. So when I first met her seven years ago, I said, Miss Lucky, did you ever meet Bobby Jones? Oh, yeah, Bobby and I used to have lunch together once in a while. We played a few holes of golf together when the last few years he played golf. And I said, well, where do you play golf? I played that little country club next door, Augusta Country Club. I played that country club next door. Now, understand that Augusta Country Club is right next door to Augusta National. Two entirely different golf courses, but they do. um, They are contiguous at one point of both golf courses, which is back behind where the 13th tee is for Augusta National. Delightful lady. If you ever go to the Masters, you got to beat her. Uh, She's younger than me, John, which is hard to believe, I know. Uh, (laughs) Now, that's the big three. So we had the triumvirate, uh, Varden, Braden, Taylor. The big three between them won, oh my gosh, how many majors did they win? Was it uh, 34, I think, majors between these three gentlemen? I'm pretty sure that's how many they won. I lost track. Uh, but the guy on the left, uh, he won most of them, 18, not too bad. The other two guys added and won quite as many. Uh, do we, this is a good question. Do we have a triumvirate today or a big three today? Oh, that's debatable. I don't think so. Well, you might say, uh, who's won the most majors lately? So Kepka's got five now. Well, Tiger, Kepka. Yeah, and- well, Tiger, but he was at... He kind of all alone there when he won his 17 there. I mean, there weren't any guys in his era that had won that many majors. When you think of it, he kind of just dominated. So there weren't that many people that could win more than. I don't just know who the three state. would be that could go with Mickelson and Woods. Yeah, yeah, that you could. Yeah, yeah. Faldo, maybe back there, Faldo, Norman. You know, there's been a couple of phases of the game where there might be, you know, two or three pretty good players. Uh, maybe today you'd say, well, Kepka's got five now, but he's not playing the American Tour on a regular basis, but he will play in all the majors. I guarantee you that. Rory's got four, does he not? Yeah. And Phil's still hanging around, but he's not playing the American Tour on a regular basis, and the game has kind of passed him by, although he still hits it a long way. But it'd be interesting just to know who people think or the, is the, maybe the modern big three or the modern triumphant? It'd be, it'd be a great question for people to debate about, you know, after a round. Well, we got to give credit to Dave Beyer from uh, Anaheim Hills and Dad Miller. He, uh, he had the Fuzzy Zeller um, uh, quiz correct, uh, question correct. Oh, he did. Good for him. Good for him. <laughs> so there's a picture of, of, of the that we, if you go there, they just call it the National. For people that are members there, they just call it the National. There's a great shot of the uh, the 12th green there, which is, boy, what a, what, that's such a fun hole to watch the players play. Now, I'm going to back up to the final thing I want to make a comment on, is that you should know something about the history of your own golf course, okay? That's something that just galls me that People work at a golf course for years and they don't know much about the golf course. Who designed it? When did it open? Who were some of the f- famous people that played there? Sooner or later, I'll get back to this guy, old George Von Elm. Where did they go? There's Georgie. Okay. So George was our golf professional at Hacienda for a short spell, 1950 to 1953, in his uh, twilight years, if you will. His nickname was Gix. He was, he was actually born in Utah, so he wasn't truly a Dutchman, but he was called the Dutchman. Uh, in 1926, he, he beat Jones to win a U.S. amateur. But here's something that's a really interesting tidbit of information. In 1931, he lost the longest playoff in U.S. Open to Billy Burke at Inverness in Toledo, Ohio. Back in those days, they finished with 36 holes on Saturday. They didn't play tournaments on Sunday. So back in those days... They had an 18-hole, excuse me, uh, yeah, an 18-hole playoff to determine who won. That was on Sunday. After 18 holes, they tied again. <laughs> so then they had another 18-hole playoff on Monday. Uh, excuse me, I, I've got this wrong. They had a 36-hole playoff on Sunday. They tied again. They had another 36-hole playoff on Monday, Okay. And he lost by one shot to Billy Burke. 
So they played 144 holes of golf and he lost by one shot. So you can only imagine how crestfallen he was at that. But he still played professional golf for about another 15 or 20 years and then finally became our head pro at Hacienda for a short spell. Uh, our course designer at Hacienda was Willie Watson. They kind of combined his efforts with Max Baer. And I can tell you a lot about the history of golf at Hacienda. But I think that's something that people ought to know more about the golf course where they work. Now, John, you've been at South Hills for a number of years. So who designed South Hills? Uh, uh, William Bell. What's that? Billy Bell. Okay, Billy Bell. Very good. Yeah. Billy Bell I, I bet you if you asked 100 PGA professionals who designed the golf course they're working at, that less than 30 of them would know who it was. And that that, that always shocks me. That is and shocking. Maybe, and that, that, uh, that, that's definitely uh, an important tidbit that every local pro needs to know. Speaking yeah. of your, your tenure at Hacienda, now before the Hacienda remodel that took place in 2001, 2002, prior to that, Tiger Woods had the course record there at 61 or 62 while you were there. Can you talk a little bit about that uh, record setting round? Yeah, so so the remodel was 2007, but yeah, 1994, uh, Tiger won the Southern California Amateur shot 62 in the second round. Uh, and he did it with smoke and mirrors, I got to tell you, because <laughs> he, he had a couple of shots that really, one bounced off the cart path on number three up onto the green, and it could have gone anywhere. Uh, he hit it. Uh, well, that number, our number 14, he drove it way to the right uh, and had to hit it up through the trees and hit it over the green and then chipped it in from behind the green. And it was a rear hole placement to begin with. I mean, that should have been a five and that turned into a three. But the most amazing part of that round was on the front nine, he went four, three, 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 five. So he made, yes, he made seven threes in a row. Uh, one of them was an eagle on number seven, obviously. And then he bogeys number nine. He bogeys number nine, which is probably, I think, back in those days, it's only like 385 back in those days. He had three wood off the tee, chunked the nine iron, shorted the green. And in 94, Tiger, uh, you know, a young player back in those days, skinny little kid, only had a flop shot for a chip shot. He did not have a pitch and run. Uh, all he had to was just throw it way up in the air and hope that lands softly. The flag was right rear. And he kind of popped that up in the air and left himself about an 18 footer and missed that. So that was the only bogey he had that day, but seven threes in a row. On now, the Andy, prior, that was prior to the remodel. So I know now the ninth green slopes from left to right very aggressively. I don't remember it having that pitch back then. It was a pretty straightforward green back then, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It, it still had the false front, a little bit of a false front, but you're right. It didn't have quite that much slope from left to right as the golfer faces it from the fairway. So it was a relatively flat green. So he had a pretty simple pitch shot, if you will, but he, he didn't have a normal pitch shot. He just had that floppy. That's, that's all he had as a kid. You know, he probably would admit admit to that this day and i was kind of interesting with when he was inducted into the hall of fame and he mentioned hacienda golf club because uh we love to have him back there in fact we had fred couples was out there this last summer summer when uh, when i was rehired as the head pro for six months as some people know so fred came out of a sunday morning and the first thing he looked i says let me, let me do you have anything with, with tiger on it? he walks down uh, past our trophy case and he starts taking pictures with his phone he says i'm sending this to the kid and i'm sending this to the kid i wonder if the kid's seen these you know <laughs> so they have a very good relationship obviously and that that's a fun thing that that, that day that he spent at hacienda mr couples was such a nice guy he did a lot of selfies with people and and uh you know people were just hey that's tiger i mean excuse me hey that's fred and i said well yes it is but uh, don't bug him oh i gotta get a picture with him but he was ever so accommodating ever so accommodating <laughs> what was uh what was the uh hacienda's inception year uh 1920 1920 it's interesting to see the the local equity clubs in the area and when they started uh, red hill was 1922 Hacienda in 1920, but South Hills wasn't until 1952 because that area was pretty unincorporated and mostly orange groves for a lot longer period of time than 
the Hacienda area and certainly the Rancho Cucamonga area where Route 66 comes by and the Sycamore Inn is there. Yeah. And uh, South Hills is actually very young in, in, in comparison to those two other clubs, it's surprising. Yeah, yeah, Hacienda was literally a sheep ranch owned by the San Sanina family for, for years and years until they built the golf course in 1920. And we've still got pictures of what it looked like when it was first built uh, throughout the clubhouse. And it's uh, quite a transition. I mean, it, lo it looked like a Lynx golf course then. And now that we're taking out more and more trees, which I don't like too much, it's starting to look more like a Lynx golf course. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, John, that wraps it up for me, I hope. So if I'll mute there. Um, looking at the Q&A, we've had some questions from uh, me and Gene, the Birdie Machine Park. Thank you, Gene. And some commentary from Dave Beyer. Actually, Dave Beyer, when I was the golf professional at Candlewood, and Andy, when were you, what were the years that you were the golf professional at Candlewood? Uh, I was there 78 to 83, and I think it was 1981 or two, we celebrated the 25th anniversary of the club having bought it from uh, Forrest Smith. And I got to play with Tommy and Johnny Jacobs, who grew up there because their father, Keith Jacobs, was the green superintendent there. And boy, was I could tell you stories about that round with Tommy and Johnny Jacobs. We won't go into that now. <laughs> you actually met uh, the Candlewood logo with the word and the tree coming out of the L, you designed that logo. I did. Thank you, sir. I did. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And the and the logo that they're using now, uh, I actually designed in 2008 because I was the golf professional there from 2006 to 2012. And uh, it's just interesting the the history of that. But Dave Beyer, uh, a little bit more on Dave Beyer. Doctor Beyer and Mrs. Beyer. Dave's parents were longtime members at Candlewood. Right. And, and Mrs. Beyer actually took lessons from George Von Elm at Hacienda. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes. Wow. Yes. So I mean, you know, golf is golf such board. a such a small uh, and and tight knit community. It's fun to run into people that know people. I just played um, down down here at uh, at Indian. Andy. <laughs> oh, Rich Melick, who's. Um, Whose, whose sister is is uh, the wife of Ed Holmes. So that's a, another coincidence. Oh, wow. Well, awesome. Well, uh, Andy, on behalf of the Education Committee for the Southern California PGA, thank you again for coming on the webcast. You're always such a treat and a treasure for our section. And uh, thank you very, very much for, for taking the time to educate uh, the uh, the membership this morning on the Catalyst. For all the PGA members joining us this morning, you will receive one PDR credit for being on this morning's webcast. And uh, we'll be sending out a, a recording, a YouTube recording of Andy's presentation, and it will be available on the section website under the education dropdown. Thank you, everybody, for supporting the Catalyst. Andy, everybody, have a great day. Thank you.